A few days ago, Demolition News brought you details of a report about an incident in which an AR demolition excavator had fallen into an unseen underground void. Well, that report has already proved to be our most viewed story of the past 18 months or so, even though it was published on a Saturday when things are traditionally fairly quiet. So I decided to follow up with AR Demolition's Richard Dolman to find out why he'd been so open about the incident, but moreover to find out about the incident itself. So Richard, let's start at the beginning. Where and when did the incident actually take place? Uh, we were on a project in Nottingham and the it would be the Friday the 8th of January, so the first Friday back to work. Now, judging by the photographs that I've seen, the machine actually fell onto the cab side. How did you go about getting the operator out? So the operator, he, um, uh, once he realised what had happened, he, um, he just removed his, um, all of the windows on the machine had all popped out um, and some smashed, including the rear window. And he just removed the, um, the headrest off his seat and he came out of the rear window. And actually, that was one of the first lessons learned, really, is... You know, freeing an excavator from a potentially trapped situation and we did a bit more investigating around the machine and we did learn that also that the the demo cage so the way our demo cages are they the, the top cage hinges it hinges up so we're going to do a bit about operator rescue with our with our workforce on you know if there's an operator trapped in a cab what are the possibilities of getting them out now, we'll get on to your response to the incident in a second, but ultimately this was an incident in which somebody could have been very seriously hurt. Given your reputation for training standards and professionalism, how do you reconcile that? You know, somebody, somebody could have been killed. It could have been, you know, a lot nastier than it was. Um, fortunately, we're in a world where nobody was injured and we've just got a bit of bent metal to straighten and, uh, and perhaps some pride. But the... Um, it's actually the second incident we've had of this type, Mark, in um, in little over um, around twelve months. The other one was far less significant. It was um, you know an operator error that uh, lost the, uh, um, his orientation and reversed the track down a known about open top void. But so when you get something like this, you think you know you've got a duty to investigate it properly. And our actual full investigation is still ongoing, um, and. And we feel that there's there's lessons learned to this, so it's it's got to go out. But the so the way this now works is we've we've interviewed everybody involved, we've looked at all the um all the footage that we've we've got of it, and then actually this afternoon we have a, an internal um meeting, all the, the the directors of the company, the people involved, the 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 safety team, and we we challenge we investigate it and we'll challenge each other hard. And we'll hopefully have the answers of what we could have done better to prevent it. Isn't a site investigation and backfilling of voids like Demolition 101? And, and if so, why didn't that take place here? Yeah, it is. But we, you know, as 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 with a lot of these things, there's more, more to this than meets the eye. The client had done a, a, a pretty good, um, I can't criticise their, their work at all. They'd done a good site investigation, gave us good information. We then do our site surveys. And none of that threw up any, you know, talk of basements or voids. It's it's clear, it's important that we point out this wasn't a basement. This was just a void underneath the building. It was part of the construction. It wasn't a, an area that was ever habited. It was just literally a void to, to do with levelling ground up the... And then, you know, we, we never found anything that led us to believe there was a void or a basement. It's also worth noting that access to the building was very limited because of um, unsafe floors above. The first floor, or the floors, a lot of them were rotten, so we couldn't get into a lot of the building. And then the big thing is, is you know, one of our protocols and a lot of people's protocols is, is, is the acid test, is before an excavator um, or a demolition rig goes onto a slab, is that the driver gives a slab a, you know, a very good bash with the, the attachment to the machine and, and acid tests it, but, um, what a lot of people wouldn't be aware of that we are aware of is part of our scope of this was the slab was to remain intact and we weren't to damage the slab so then you you start to steer towards should we have done core holes should we have done a, a gpr survey and I'd, I'd imagine our investigation is going to land at um looking more at doing core holes and um ground penetration radars but 
even then, how reasonably practical is it? You know, if you're doing core holes, it's it's a bit needle in a haystack, isn't it? Particularly on a large site. If you're doing GPR, how accurate is it? There's a, there's a combination of these things got to come together, and we'll have the the answers hopefully when we've finished um, or when we've reviewed our investigation. So take me through the investigation. I know when we first spoke in the immediate aftermath, there was some suggestion that there was some CCTV footage that had actually captured the incident taking place. Yes, we have got CCTV footage, and our intention is to um, is to uh, do something with that as well, let people see that. But um, being honest, I want to make sure that we can do that and then uh, it doesn't get uh, used uh, in a negative way in the future. But if we can put it out there correctly, we will do. Now, this isn't the first time that you've come clean about an incident. In fact, I think the last time you and I actually spoke on, on this very show, you were talking about reinstigating uh, an online forum to allow others to share their experiences as well. So why have you come clean again? And, and why do you believe it's so important? Uh, there may well be always people that, are, that will question why you come clean. But, Mark, you know, and, and I know I, I, I have a reputation for... Um, wanting to share best practice. I mean, I think it's it's about eight years ago now, the first time that I did it. Um, and then um, two or three years ago, I did I did a piece on something that we learned about a fire extinguisher where we, we, we had a potential incident. Nobody was hurt, but it could have easily been a death. And the interesting thing about that, that particular incident and uh, this incident it's the amount of people that have come out of the woodwork and all said, we've had the same. You know, we, we've we've had demolition rigs go through slabs. We've had exploding fire extinguishers. Yeah, if you, you go on the internet and do searches, there's very little there, particularly on the fire extinguishers. Yet, the minute you, you put your head up and say, oh, we've had this happen, lots of people will come out and say they've had the same, which proves the point that we're not sharing lessons learned. So... You know, I was talking to you within 48 hours of the incident. I was talking to the NFDC within 48 hours of the incident, saying to both that I intended to go to go public. And yeah, I just know no different. It's just it's just what you do. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, this story has proved exceptionally popular. And I think about 99.9% .9 of the people that have responded have done so very positively. But there have been suggestions that you only came clean because photographs of the incident were circulating on social media. How do you respond to that? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I'd, ex I'd expect nothing less of, 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 of that. That's part of the problem, is it not, with our industry? Um, full stop is that you poke your head above the parapet to try and do something, you know, for the good, for the better good of the industry. And there's always somebody that wants to um, have a snipe at you. But the, you j I just have to rise above that, that type of behaviour. And the industry as a whole needs to rise above that type of behaviour. Because if not, we're going to stay where we are, you know, miles behind lots of other industries that accept that we, you know, that people have incidents and, and that we're to learn from those incidents and we're to professionalise ourselves and that we're to you know, get a lot better at sharing, learning, improving. Is what you've done a precedent? Are you expecting others to follow your lead and, and become equally transparent on incidents in the future? I don't know. I don't know if I'm setting a, a precedent. I, I don't expect anybody to do anything. I just like to think that people could, you know, do realise the better good of of sharing lessons learned because it you know it might it might save a life it might save a it might save a um a serious industry uh, a serious incident injury and and ultimately does it not professionalize our industry and is that not what it's all about because what the industry is brilliant at doing is moaning and groaning about how Clients are always trying to tell us how to do our job and clients look down upon us. And, well, if we're really honest, whose fault's that? And, and, and until we really get serious about, you know, wanting to improve ourselves, then that's, that we'll, we'll, it'll stick with us. And, and, and you know, with a, bit, a bit like the degrees, really, the, the interest from the, 
um, the industry is not as good as I'd hope. And it's because, sadly, there's a lot of people setting their ways. 